Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be looking at Jungian metaphysics, the metaphysics of the great Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung. With me is my friend Bernardo Kastrup. Bernardo, over the past decade, has written a dozen books explicating his metaphysical view that he calls analytical idealism. Some of his recent titles include Decoding Jung's Metaphysics, Decoding Schopenhauer's Metaphysics, The Idea of the World, and Science Ideated. Bernardo lives in the Netherlands, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Bernardo. It's a real pleasure to be with you after so many months. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Jeff. I'm looking forward to it. In your book, Decoding Jung's Metaphysics, you point out that uh, since you were a teenager, Jung has had a big influence on, on your life. In fact, I think you suggest so large an influence that it, it may even be operating at the unconscious level. Oh, that's uh, almost a certainty um, um, because I was so influenced by him so early on that sometimes it's hard to tell which ideas are mine and which are his, just sort of elaborated uh, in different words in a different way, but uh, at root, his ideas. I think he was uh, the key link uh, in the 20th century between the streams of idealism, German idealism in the 19th and 18th century and the renaissance of uh, idealism in the 21st. Jung held the candle alive during the darkness of positivism and behaviorism and all that stuff. You mentioned that the uh, first time you encountered Jung was in his comments on the I Ching. Yeah, I think it was a foreword or a preface. I, I don't quite remember, but I was, uh, I was in the mountains. I was a kid uh, on holidays with my family in the mountains. And I was sort of roaming around the town on my own, and there was this prominently prominently displayed book on a bookshop called the I Ching, and I thought, what the hell is that? And I picked it up, started sort of browsing it, and pretty clear, it was pretty clear very quickly that it was a kind of oracle, and which sort of demotivated me immediately. I thought, ah, okay, man, one of those silly oracles. But then there was this foreword by one Carl Gustav Jung, um, which caught me and, and it provided a, a sense of, or a space of plausibility for that thing that I could, would not have imagined for myself. It was something incommensurable with my way of thinking at the time. And Jung sort of opened the tunnel <laughs> that allowed me to see a different space. Because that particular essay, as I recall, emphasizes his notion of synchronicity, which is one of the most mysterious and deepest notions in Jungian thought. I think many Jungians are very uncomfortable with it. True. And, and a lot of people who want to squeeze Jung neatly into some kind of physicalist compatible box uh, they have to glance over synchronicities because the implications of that squarely take Jung away from a materialist or physicalist way of thinking. Um, so, yeah, I can imagine that some Jungians are uncomfortable with that. A whole lot uh, of other Jungians don't, don't quite understand it. Um, but it is a key element of Jung's implicit metaphysics, which runs through his entire corpus. Now, I have read Jung's preface to uh, another classic mystical book, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the Evans Wentz translation. And in there, he goes so far as to suggest that the psyche itself is the basis of metaphysics. In fact, I think he says even more that it is the metaphysical reality. <laughs> 
you hear echoes of that throughout his corpus. There was there there is a letter. It doesn't get any more unambiguous than this letter that he wrote to Father White, um, who was one of his friends. He was a theologian and a priest. Um, and in that letter, he says, "To me, the psyche is an usia, and usia is a Greek word that means something that has standalone existence." something irreducible, fundamental, uh, that's not dependent or derived from anything else. So he states right there that for him, the psyche is a new sea, and it doesn't get more unambiguous than that. And in other parts of his corpus, he says, it's the psyche that creates its body, not the body that creates the psyche. He repeats it more than once. Um, he pokes fun at materialism variously calling it absurd or you know, something that is not thought through. Um, so, yeah, there is very little question about where his uh, metaphysical views uh, <laughs> stood. You have a very interesting discussion in your book, Decoding Jung's Metaphysics, about the distinction between uh, the way we use the word consciousness and the way Jung uses the word psyche. The, the crucial part is how he uses the word consciousness, because what he calls consciousness is a lot more restrictive than what philosophers today call phenomenal consciousness or raw experience, if you will. For Jung, consciousness is not only experience, but it's experience that is uh, connected in a web uh, of cognitive associations, um, an experience that is metacognitive, that, that there is volitional explicit control over your thoughts, over your emotions. So it's an appeal to cognitive associations, to metacognition. Um, so it's much more restrictive than phenomenal consciousness. And because of that, what he calls the psyche, that is what we call today phenomenal consciousness. Uh, the, the, the inherent quality of the psyche is that it, it is experiential in nature. And consciousness, although experiential too, and therefore a part of the psyche, it's a more specific definition that requires a web of cognitive associations and metacognitive awareness. Now, Jung came out of a Freudian tradition. He was originally, I guess you'd have to say, a, a protege of Freud. And Freud emphasizes the unconscious, and that's a little bit confusing for people. How is it that the unconscious is also associated with consciousness? For Freud, it probably was not because he was a neurologist, a materialist, so for him, the unconscious was physiological instead of properly psyche, psychic. Um, for Jung, that's clearly not the case. He is very explicit about the, this um, gradual distinction between the pure, purely physiological and the psychically unconscious. So unconscious for Jung means something that you cannot access through explicit introspection. In other words, things that you are experiencing, but you don't know that you are experiencing because either you cannot access it through metacognition or your executive ego is dissociated from it. But the contents of the unconscious are experiential. There are segments, particularly in on the nature of the psyche, a very long essay in which Jung tackles this, um, he says that the unconscious is a kind of consciousness. And then he proceeds to explain what he means by that. So it's very clear that for Jung, um, the unconscious and consciousness as part of the psyche are both experiential in nature. I, I think you use the word traffic, referring to the exchange of, uh, I don't know what I would call it, archetypes, information, impulses between the conscious mind and the Jungian unconscious or the collective unconscious. Exactly. So for Jung, uh, experiential contents can move across these elusive boundaries between the unconscious and consciousness and between the impersonal or the collective unconscious and the personal unconscious. And he describes that using the metaphor of a spectrum, a spectrum of light. So he says, well, uh, whatever you are in the spectrum, it is light that you're talking about or 
electromagnetic field oscillations. So the nature of the thing is always the same, but there is a change in the degree of some of its properties. In the case of the spectrum, it's the frequency. So he says that uh, between the collective unconscious, the, the personal unconscious and consciousness, uh, it's like a spectrum. Things can move across those boundaries uh, by changing some of their specific properties. But the nature of the thing that moves is always the same, whatever it's located in that psychic spectrum. And that nature is experiential. I guess this, this is a little bit tricky for me, and that is, uh, and probably uh, you've got a good handle on it as a computer scientist yourself. We know that computers are capable of manipulating information without any consciousness whatsoever, without any experience. So it would seem to me that information is not necessarily experiential at all. That's correct. Information is the way we found, the most efficient way we found in 1948 uh, to describe uh, the states and the dynamics of the states of a system, information is therefore a description. It's not a nucia, it's not a thing in and of itself. It doesn't have standalone existence, it's a way to describe something else. So the, the argument in the book is not that um, we are talking about informational content. No, we are talking about psychic content, which can be described as information. But that's just a description. Um, for Jung, matter itself, and, and, and that's something that you can only see if you really read a large part of his corpus, because he dances around it. There, there is no one specific place where he makes the entire case. You, you, you have to go across the boundaries of specific works. Um, he makes the point that the collective unconscious, the way it looks to us, if we observe it with our sense organs, uh, is the physical world that surrounds ourselves. So that's his way of sort of accounting for matter within an idealist experiential framework. Um, in the same way that uh, the contents of the collective unconscious can present themselves to you in a dream as images that you experience endogenously, in the waking state, those images that you experience around you with your eyes open, those too are symbolic manifestations of the collective unconscious. Your body, therefore, being a manifestation of your personal unconscious and your ego. So... That's how Jung sees things. Matter is the derivative. The psyche or phenomenal conscious, consciousness is the usia. And he is surprisingly consistent in this picture across books. If you bring it together, it's a very coherent uh, picture that he builds. Jung talks about the ego, as Freud did, as being sort of a, a major organizing principle of the conscious mind, but the unconscious mind or the collective unconscious, he's very clear it doesn't have a single organizing principle in the same way. That's right. So uh, for Jung, the ego is more or less synonymous with consciousness, depends exactly on how and where he uses the words, but there is a correspondence between the ego and consciousness. And the ego consists in a web of uh, cognitively associated psychic contents, thoughts, memories, images, insights, opinions, so on and so forth. So there is a web of cognitive associations that holds uh, those psychic contents together in a more or less structured and organized way meaning that you can traverse those cognitive associations and go from an image you perceive to the memory of something you saw earlier, which may evoke a dream, which may trigger an emotion. So that's the ego, is this uh, structured uh, web of interconnected, cognitively associated psychic contents. And the unconscious for him does not have this level of organization and structure. Uh, it's a sea of psychic contents loosely associated with one another and whose associations can change, uh, are dynamic and, and fluid. 
Now, the unconscious, the Jungian unconscious, the collective unconscious uh, is populated by archetypes. And, and I think of archetypes as one of the most mysterious aspects of Jungian psychology. I often, in, in my teaching days, when I quiz my students, I ask them to define what is an archetype. They've all studied dynamic psychology, but I never get the same definition twice from my students. The key is in an essay in which Jung talks about the nature of the archetype, and he goes out of his way to say that the archetype in and of itself is empty. There is the key. So the archetype of the mother is never a particular mother. It's never a particular thought or emotion associated with the mother. The archetype in and of itself is empty. And then he makes an, an analogy with the crystals, how crystals grow. And if you know from physics and chemistry, physicals have crystals have a very well-defined uh, structure. The way the atoms come together uh, in the form of a lattice that last lattice is describable mathematically, and it's very precise. It's determined by the properties of the molecules that form the crystal. So that lattice in and of itself, there is a sense in which it exists even if no crystal existed, because it's defined by the properties of the things that come together to form a crystal. So the lattice is a template that when the crystal grows, it follows that template. But the template in and of itself is not any particular crystal. It's just a template, a particular structure, a, a particular pattern of things behaving and coming together. So that's the archetype. The archety archetype is a template of behavior of the psyche. It's a preferred way in which the psyche manifests itself. But any particular manifestation is just an instance or an expression of the archetype. It's not the archetype itself. In the same way that Plato talked about the ideal forms, uh, everything we see is just an imperfect copy of the ideal form. None of it is the form itself. So the form pre-exists any copy of it in the same way that any archetypal expression or manifestation comes after the archetype. The archetype pre-exists any of its manifestations. The, the, the best physical analogy that we could make is the harmonics of a physical system, like a guitar string. If you pluck a guitar string, it will oscillate in one of a few of its preferred modes of oscillation. It will produce one of a couple of notes, and it can never produce another note, because it, if that other note is not one of its frequencies uh, uh, of resonance or one of its harmonics, it cannot do that note. Um, the archetypes are like that. They are the harmonics of the psyche, the resonant frequencies of the psyche, um, and they pre-exist any particular vibration or excitation of the psyche. Well, one of the strangest phrases, uh, I'm still puzzling over it, that I found in your book on Jung, is the idea that the archetype can be both an object and a subject. The, if the arch archetype is a subject itself, it implies a certain amount of uh, autonomy and, and even uh, decision-making capability. That is the most out there part of uh, Jung's implied metaphysics, because the archetype, as I just described, um, is just a, a template of behavior. It's not encased uh, within the boundaries of a particular subject. Any particular subject can give expression to one or many archetypes. But uh, Jung goes further and he says that in the collective unconscious, there can be complexes that embody a particular archetype, a psychic complex, in other words, a network of connected uh, experiences um, that constitutes a embodiment of an archetype. So um, you could have a psychic complex in the unconscious that is the embodiment of the mother archetype. Now, the archetype itself precedes that complex. That complex is just an expression of an archetype. But it can be such a strong expression of a particular archetype that as a complex, all of its psychic energy, 
flows along that archetypal template. Maybe, maybe I should have defined complex. So, well, ne never mind. Uh, I think people have an intuition about it. So the energy of those associated psychic contents uh, flows according to the to the lattice or the structure or the template given by a particular archetype. So you can say this is a psychic embodiment of that archetype, and it is a kind of subject too, because if within that complex there are enough cognitive associations and and some form of metacognition arises some form of explicit introspection capability arises, then that complex is a kind of subject, not as structurally well-defined as an ego, but a kind of subject nonetheless. So uh, if you're traveling around the waters of the unconscious, you can come across incarnations, psychic incarnations of particular archetypes, like um, Philemon, for him, was a psychic incarnation of the wise old man archetype. Um, and the snake was another in, that, that he saw and he describes uh, in the Red Book was another of these incarnations. So he extrapolates from that and he says that in the collective unconscious, archetypes tend to express themselves in the form of these more or less well-structured complexes which constitute subjective embodiments uh, of that archetype. So what he's saying is that in, in his visions, Philemon was not just an image that his personal psyche projected. He's suggesting that Philemon had a kind of experiential inner life of its own, uh, a, a kind of volition and decision-making capability of its own, driven by the particular archetype that it embodied. One, one of the other really mysterious, to me, aspects of your book, Bernardo, is the equation that you make between the collective unconscious and the physical world. If I understand you correctly, you're saying they're the same. Yes. Yeah, well, I'm saying that that's what Jung implied <laughs> and sometimes even said. There is a passage in which he says that. I think I quote it in the book. He just says that there is one passage in which he just says that the material world is the collective unconscious. They are one and the same thing. Um, and the way his reasoning goes about it is the following. He's looking for certain characteristics of psychic contents, like psychic contents that seem to have an autonomy, a will of their own. And they do whatever they do, regardless of whether you as an observer like it or not. They are not under your volitional control. They run their own agenda, so to say. So that's one aspect. Another aspect is um, you cannot introspect into their inner life. You can only see their appearances. Or in Schopenhauerian terminology, uh, uh, you only have access to their representation and not to their inner will. Um, and then he goes ahead and starts looking to classify uh, his his experiences along these lines. And he goes and thinks, well, uh, when the collective unconscious manifests itself to me, in my dreams and my visions, those images seem to have a will of their own. I cannot change what they do. They do whatever their agenda tells them they do. Uh, I do not have direct access to their inner life. I only see how they appear to me. I cannot put myself inside them. I only see their external manifestation. And then he realizes that the exact same rationale applies to the physical world. It seems to have a will of its own. Um, we cannot put ourselves in the shoes of the inanimate universe. We have no access to whatever inner life the inanimate universe might have. It follows its own, its own agenda. We call that the laws of physics. And the laws of physics are whatever they are, regardless of whether we wish them to be different uh, or not. And he realizes that this is entirely analogous to the manifestations of the collective unconscious through uh, uh, introspection. So introspection and ex ex extrospection, whatever, if that word exists, uh, um, you are watching psychic images with an agenda of their own which manifest themselves to you in the form of images, appearances, representations, whatever you want to call it. So 
when you are dreaming and the collective unconscious, manif unconscious manifests to you, it's like you are inhabiting the world of collective unconscious and you have no control over it. And when you are awake, you're inhabiting the physical world and you have no control uh, over it. Uh, both uh, suggest that the ego is a sort of psychic island surrounded by the ocean of the collective unconscious, whether you are awake or whether you're dreaming. And the nail in the coffin that this is what he means is that um, this is the basis for synchronicity. The basis for synchronicity is the idea that um, it is the same psychic archetypes that manifest themselves in the images the collective unconscious produces in our inner life and the images that we call the external physical world. Therefore, it shouldn't be a surprise that there are these meaningful coincidences between the dynamics of both, because both are expressions of the same underlying psychic templates. What you've expressed makes a lot of sense to me. However, at least intuitively, or perhaps a better word would be conventionally, I think of the external world as being partially alive and partially completely inanimate. The animals are alive, but my camera is not. However, when I think of the psyche, everything is alive in the psyche as far as I'm concerned. So, uh, it, 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 I would derive from what you're saying that Jung is implying that the objects of the external world that we think of as inanimate are actually alive in some sense. Yes and no. Um, by saying that the physical world is alive in the sense that it is an expression of the collective unconscious, which in turn is psychic, he doesn't mean that particular subsets of the physical world have a private inner life of their own. Not every object in the physical world is a subject in and of itself. Um, if you were a tiny little thing traveling through the brain of another human being um, and you're traversing a synaptic cleft at the junction between two neurons, um, you would see these neurotransmitter molecules looking like enormous boulders flowing from one side to the other and causing lightning in the receptors where they lock. And you would think it's absurd to call these boulders, these neurotransmitter uh, molecules, subject. And sure enough, it is. But the brain as a whole is the appearance of a subject, and nobody questions that. So for Jung, you have to think of the inanimate universe uh, as a kind of mega brain and its subsets are just parts of the image that we call the universe they are not necessarily subjects with their own private inner life in the same sense that your neurotransmitter molecules do not do not have a private inner life of their own in other words not everything in the collective unconscious um, is a daimon or a complex with a will of its own not everything now, speaking more analytically and more technically, what we call object uh, is based on a purely nominal definition. It, it, there are no rocks. There are no rivers. Where does the river end and the ocean begin? Where does the uh, mountain end and the boulder begins? We make these distinctions. We carve out the world around us into these subsets and we give names to these subsets because it is socially convenient. If I want to buy a car, I need to have a name to refer to that which I want to buy. But there is no ontic, no, no non-nominal, no non-arbitrary reason to carve out the universe into separate parts unless we are talking about living beings which do have a private inner life of their own. So by saying that uh, the physical world is a manifestation of the collective unconscious, Jung is not implying um, that uh, your phone has an inner life of its own. Your phone is just part of the great image we call the, the physical world, which is an appearance of the collective unconscious. In, in reality, there is no such a thing as a phone. This is just a nominal, a convenient distinction that, that helps us go about life, but it doesn't have a nontic basis, uh, so to say. Um, but you and I, uh, we are diamonds of the collective unconscious. We are psychic complexes that have developed enough uh, 
internal cognitive associations, a web of cognitive associations, and the ability to sort of turn the psyche in upon itself so the psyche can examine its own contents in a metacognitive way. And that's what we call a thinking subject. So you and I are that. Uh, other animals probably are that. Jung would grant that. Um, but not a rock. There is no rock. There is only the inanimate universe as a whole. Well, you use the example of organic molecules in, in the synapses, neuro transmitters of, of various kinds. And uh, I, I guess I can see that they, uh, they are alive in some sense, but they are not autonomous entities. Exactly. They are alive in the sense that they are the appearance of psychic dynamics. But those psychic dynamics are not in them or correspond only to them. What we call these objects are just arbitrarily carved out subsets of pixels in an image. That image is the appearance of phenomenal or psychic contents, but individual subsets of pixels are just subsets of the image. They do not necessarily correspond to a private, internally dissociated in a life of its own. And I presume you would say the same thing about certain contents in a dream. If I dream of a rock, it doesn't mean that that rock in my dream has subjective awareness of any kind. Exactly. And you, you can draw this thought experiment further and then you can make everything clear. Uh, we call a certain thing a table. There is a subset of the pixels we see uh, around us, the image we see around us, one of its subsets of pixels we call a table. Now, is the table then a subject? Does it have an inner life of its own? All right, let's say it has. Then it has four feet. So do each of those feet have an inner life of their own? You may say, no, only the table. Yeah, but then if I pull a f one of these uh, feet away, uh, does it then acquire an inner life of its own separate from the rest of the table? You can play this game down to molecules. Uh, uh, and you quickly see that what we call a thing is an arbitrary carving out of a subset of pixels of a great image. Now, that great image corresponds to psychic inner life, but the subsets we carve out may not correspond to a separate psychic inner life of their own. They are just part of a great image. Jung used the process of active imagination in order to explore the psyche. I think you would describe that as an experiential process rather than an analytical process. And I, I've engaged in an exercise, I call it holographic thinking. I could take any object, like here I have a teacup, and, and I can project if I wish to find wisdom in the teacup, I could have a conversation with it. It would probably turn out to be very intelligent. I could call this a projection of my own psyche, but where is the boundary between my psyche and any uh, object? Jung struggled with this, and he goes to great lengths to try to, try to explain where the boundary lies uh, for you to engage in true active imagination. Um, and the whole technique starts with just normal imagination. In other words, the images you're producing are a product of your own personal psyche. They do not have a will of their own. They are not subjects. They are uh, projections of your own psyche. In other words, you're imagining th uh, those things. But Jung says that if you do it correctly, there comes a point where the images begin to acquire a certain autonomy. They start behaving in a way that you didn't induce through uh, forcefully imagining them to perform that behavior. Um, and, and that is the sweet spot. That's the liminal space between ordinary imagination and active imagination in which the contents that you're imagining become active of their own accord. And that's when you start talking to the unconscious, so to say. Otherwise, it's just the ego talking to itself by projecting its own imagery in our internal theater of experience. Um, uh, I find it very, very difficult to cross that threshold in which the images acquire a certain autonomy. And then and that's that's when the message begins. That's when something is being told to the ego. For me, it's very difficult. Um, uh, 
I need to be particularly distressed or very tired, um, off center in some way, and then that can happen. Or, or, or if I haven't slept for two days in a row, which has happened in my corporate life, uh, um, the images acquire a certain autonomy. They behave of their own accord, and then a true dialogue begins. But for me, it requires this this tremendous levels of, level of stress. Otherwise, they are not autonomous. They just do what I imagine them to be doing. <laughs> Well, you do describe in your book some fascinating examples, uh, not of active imagination, but something uh, similar, which, which are classic Jungian synchronicities that occurred to you in the process of, I, I presume, maybe I'm wrong about that, in the process of writing your book about Jung. That's, that's correct. Yeah, it was in the process of writing the book that was so appropriate, right, that all of that should happen while I was writing the book. Um, as part of my research, at some point, I, I went to Jung's birthplace uh, in Switzerland, and it's the, mar the margins of uh, Lake Constance, uh, of the, the Bodensee. Um, and it, there was a sunny afternoon, very lazy. I, you know, I was not under pressure. I was so officially on holidays. And I was just uh, uh, walking bare, bare feet with bare foot, uh, uh, um, bare foot along the margins uh, of the lake, and my feet were underwater, 20 centimeters of water or so. And I was looking ahead to to the place where I knew Jung had been born. It was just ahead uh, of where I was. And then you start performing sort of uh, autonomous associations, right? You're not guiding those associations; they ju they just come to you. And the image that came to me was a scene Jung describes in his autobiography in which he was sort of building a little city out of pebbles. Uh, it was one of his ways to, to relax. And he built a little church, but he was missing an appropriate pebble, pebble to serve as the altar. And then he, as soon as he had the thought, he chanced upon a pyramidal red stone. And he picked it up and he thought, this is the, the ideal altar. And he put it in. And that image came to me as I was walking. And I was like, well, I am walking on a lake too, and I'm stepping on Lake Pebbles. And then I automatically looked down, and there was a red four-faced uh, pyramidal <laughs> pebble, uh, one and a half inch tall, exactly like Jung described. And then, of course, I thought, well, this lake is probably full of it. So there's no synchronicity. So I started looking for another, and there was no other. Um, and the fact that that image came to me, when the image came to me, I was not looking down, thinking of pebbles. I was looking ahead to the place where Jung had been born. And I still have that pebble. Well, I don't have it here, otherwise I could show you. Uh, um, when I read Jung's book, I thought it, he's taking poetic license here because I have never seen a pyramidal, four-faced pyramidal red pebble. I mean, this is not normal erosion, right? <laughs> And then there was one. I held it in my hand. I photographed it. I put a photo in the book. And then a few days later, I was walking on the mountains in Switzerland, another magical place for Jung. And I came across a pyramidal boulder in a very isolated valley. I thought somebody carved this. But when you get closer, you see, no, no, that's just you know, erosion from ice and, and flowing water. Um, I, was, I was stunned by it. Well, I agree. It, it's stunning, these synchronicities. Wouldn't there be some sort of deeper meaning in it for you? The process I was engaging in of writing a book about Jung's metaphysics was in tune, in resonance with where nature wanted to go. I, I, as a tool, I was performing the job. <laughs> If you know what I mean, Th that was the reassuring part of it to me. It's like, well, I'm writing this book. It's what I should be doing right now. That's what nature wants to do through me. And, and these synchronicities are just like messages saying, keep going, go ahead, because this is the resonant path. You know, you're in tune with the ebb and flow of nature here. I think that's a great way to interpret synchronicities, uh, especially you know, pleasant ones.
on occasion. Absolutely. Uh, on occasion. <laughs> some are warnings. Yeah, some are. In, indeed, some are. Well, uh, now, other people have also looked at Jung's metaphysics. I think Roderick Maine, a Jungian therapist, uh, talks about Jung as a, a, a dual aspect monist. And I know you dispute that interpretation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Jung is very clear. Look, Duo aspect monism says that um, what the world really is, is not matter or psyche. It's a third mysterious thing which manifests itself or appears as matter sometimes and other times as psyche. So it's an implication of dual aspect monism that the psyche is not an usia, it's an appearance, just like matter. But Jung is very explicit. The psyche is an usia, and matter is an appearance of psychic processes. There is no way this can possibly be dual aspect monism. Um, people interpret certain passages of Jung's correspondence with Pauli. Uh, there is one particular passage that seems to be suggestive of, of dual aspect monism. And then people run with that. But you cannot read only that one paragraph. You have to, to at least read the entire letter, at least that one letter from beginning to end. And if you do that, it becomes very clear what is meant. Uh, and all of this is documented in the book. I quote everything, you know, and I cite everything down to paragraph and page. Um, uh, I can state very categorically with as much confidence a scholar can possibly have that Jung was not a dual aspect monist. At the same time, I think it's fair to say that Jung tried very hard to achieve scientific credibility for his work. He wanted to be seen as a scientist, and he uh, came out of the, the 19th century, one of the most materialistic eras in the history of humanity. So he had to contend in one way or another with the materialism of the colleagues with whom he identified. Sure. In a letter to Pauli, he even says, uh, I, I wanted to fit in. <laughs> and the context was exactly what you said. He said, I wanted to fit in with my materialist colleagues. So uh, because of that, from most of his career, he, he, he at least nominally tried to stay away from metaphysics because his point was, well, whatever the psyche is, I can study how it behaves. And that's all I need to help my patients. If I know how the psyche behaves, I can help my patients regardless of whether the psyche is primary or secondary or materialism, idealism, dual aspect monism, whatever. Uh, so there are many passages in which he says that I am a scientist and I'm not getting into philosophy. Why did he say that? Because he was doing his main work um, at the birth of positivism at the birth of the analytic stream of philosophy with Russell, Wittgenstein, um, and philosophy got a bad name at that time. Um, there was this, this ethos that philosophy is badly done science and that science replaces philosophy. Today we know better. Today we know that these things are complementary. Science is about behavior. Metaphysics is about being. Uh, you need both and you, you cannot eliminate one with the other. Um, but Jung was a man of his time, so he was concerned. So he nominally tried to stay away from philosophy and metaphysical speculation, but he couldn't help. He just couldn't help. His corpus is peppered with metaphysical assertions all over the place. From the, I mean, when he became the Jung we know in the early 20s, he held back. But from 1932, 33, when he gave his uh, Terry lectures in the US, he just peppered metaphysical assertions everywhere. And if you bring them together, you realize that they form a very internally consistent whole, a very coherent metaphysical system. And towards the end of his life, he just said, well, yes, I do metaphysics, all right. I, uh, it, it was impossible not to. So that's what I did. And he says that in these many words. And in his autobiography, he goes all out. He goes beyond metaphysics. He goes into spirituality, which he had already gone before in answer to Job. 
but he arranged things in such a way that he had some plausible deniability even after answer to Job in 1957. But from 59 on, it's like he didn't care. He, he just said, I, have, I do metaphysics. I've done metaphysics. Uh, yeah, that's what it is. Your interpretation of answer to Job is very interesting because some would suggest that he is trying to reduce religion to uh, something psychological. And you're saying it's, it's practically the reverse. He is building religious ideas uh, from his insights into the psyche. It is true that Jung put God in the psyche. And because we assume that the psyche is an epiphenomenon of matter, in other words, something that doesn't really exist, it's a side effect of something else, it's ephemeral, will come to an, end, to an end in no time at all, it's not significant. By putting God there, we think, well, he did away with God, because if God is inside the psyche, and the psyche is an epiphenomenon, then God doesn't really exist. And Tom uh, Cupid, he basically said, yeah, Jung just put God in the psyche, so consistent with physicalism. What people don't stop to think is that for Jung, the psyche was not an epiphenomenon. For Jung, the psyche was the matrix of all being, all of existence, the entire universe. So putting God in the psyche is not to reduce God at all. It's to place God in the only place God could possibly be, <laughs> because it's the only thing that exists, the only kind of substance, the only ontic category that exists, is the psyche for Jung. So there, there is a passage in which he even says the psyche has no, no, no limits. So if it is a matter of space, putting God in the psyche is not to con contain God in any way. He says that, he, he clarifies that. Um, but what people do, and you see that so much in scholarship, they find particular passages and particular quotes and they take it out of context and they run with it. And, and, and therefore, well, Jung put the psyche, uh, Jung put God uh, in the position of an epiphenomenon. Jung is a dual aspect uh, monist or uh, um, the, the worst of them all, people who say um, the collective unconscious is a genetic inheritance, according to Jung. That is the ultimate insult. Jung would probably turn on his grave because he was so bloody explicit in so many passages that that is not what he meant. There was one interview he gave to television in 1957 in which he made a comparison between the collective unconscious and our, and our, our phylogenetic history. Uh, he was, he was trying to make an analogy uh, focused on the idea of inheritance. Both are, are things we inherit. But he cannot possibly think that the collective unconscious is a genetic inheritance if the archetypes manifest in the world at large, which was a basis for synchronicities, because the world at large doesn't receive a genetic inheritance from us. It has no genes. So how can it manifest the archetypes just as we manifest the archetypes in our psyche. So obviously the archetypes, the collective unconscious for Jung are not genetic inheritance, but some well-known Jungians uh, have written that uh, that's what it is. I find this very bad scholarship. It's picking quotes, picking passages, and not understanding the corpus and the system that is discernible if you look at the whole of one's work. I think of Jung as probably probably the greatest thinker of the 20th century. Uh, or I am with you there. Certainly one of the top handful. But in any case, I'm puzzled by the fact that Jungian psychology is, at least in the United States and I suspect elsewhere, barely taught at all in the universities. And I'm, I think this is a real puzzle. How is it that one of the greatest thinkers of an entire century is ignored largely within academia? What do you make of that? It's because of the philosophical underpinning of his thought, which was heretic for the, almost the entire 20th century. Uh, and people smell it. People smell the idea that, you know, 
the collective unconscious as a matrix as opposed to a repository of discarded contents of consciousness, like Freud put it, uh, uh, that this whole idea of an active creative matrix in the form of the collective unconscious that spreads beyond the individual, I mean, that's woo-woo stuff. Uh, we are not going to touch that. So instead of studying dreams like Jung did uh, in the 20th century, he began studying dreams by make, uh, collecting statistics about, about how often particular images appear in the dream and then producing this sort of... Uh, histograms uh, of statistical occurrences of things. This is like trying to study the Cologne Cathedral by inventorizing how many types of bricks were used. You reduce Cologne's cathedral to a pile of different bricks, a few piles of bricks. Is that what the Cologne Cathedral is? Of course not. The creative force of Cologne Cathedral is how you put the bricks together. And that's how Jung looks at dreams. How does the unconscious put the images together? What meaning is it expressing through that? Um, and, and that is very hard to study in a way that you can publish papers in analytic or psychological journals because you need to produce plots and graphs and statistical analysis and cross the statistical significance a significance threshold, which is entirely arbitrary. Jung tried to see Cologne's cathedral, but Cologne's cathedral is not amenable to the methods that we consider the appropriate ones to study the psyche in the 20th century, and actually to this day. So, of course, he's not going to be taught because people don't know what to do with his thinking. Um, and, and to apply Jungian psychology, you have to be more than a psychologist. You basically have to be a, a classical scholar. You have to know so much in order to identify the, the cognitive associations that the connective unconscious is operating on the basis of. Um, I think this will change at some point in the future when we mature. But whether he's taught in academia or not, it's almost irrelevant. You know, the greatest innovators in history were not in academia. Nietzsche was not in academia. Uh, 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 Schopenhauer was not in academia. Uh, Kant was, okay, every now and then you find one. Uh, uh, Kierkegaard was not in academia. So it, it doesn't say much about Jung. It says something about this, the stage where we are in academia. But academia or not, he held, he held it together for us in the 20th century. He kept us linked to the wisdom of our ancestors. He didn't allow it to die in, 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 in the darkest age of our philosophy. You know, positivism and behaviorism together. That's the darkest of dark ages uh, uh, in the history of uh, Western thought. And, and he kept the candle burning and alive. And, you know, he, he took the two opposites of, of, of this chain and kept them connected in the 20th century so we wouldn't lose touch with ourselves. And he, I, I, I predict, give it another century or two and he will be recognized for that. Bernardo Castro, what a joy to be with you once again. Always a fantastic pleasure to talk to you, Jeff. I always enjoy it enormously. Thank you so much for being with me today, Bernardo. And I'm pleased to let our viewers know we have another interview planned in a few weeks based on your newest book, Science Ideated. So I'm very much looking forward to that as well. Me too. <laughs> Bernardo, thank you again for being with me. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us.